It's January 24th, 2012, and North Carolina's The Sign of the Southern Cross have just released a studio documentary for their upcoming album. Their fan base is chomping at the bit, rewinding the video over and over to hear the snippets of new tracks that have been littered through the studio footage. We're all pumped, eager to hear more. We watch as the vocalist, Seth, looks directly into the camera and says, This record is massive. You can't fucking kill it. And with that, we are assured that this record is coming, and coming soon, too. Fast forward over a decade, and most have given up hope. We're never going to get new music from Seth or the band, and we have to learn to live with that. No matter how many times people reach out to Seth, there's never even the slightest of responses. The band is dead and gone. Somehow, though, I've never quite given up on it. I've taken leaves out of their book, and despite all signs pointing to struggle and difficulties, I'm trudging on, holding on to that last little shred of hope that they'll reunite, or at the very least, put out that second full length. I spent the last few years deep diving into the North Carolina music scene, all the way from the UK through Facebook. It's been an interesting dive that has turned up more than a handful of dead ends. During this search, I found out a lot more about the band, its members, its history and its problems, and now I want to share that with you. Not much is known about the early life of Seth Aldricks, though from what I've heard on the grapevine, he was adopted by his uncle when he was very young, and competed in the Anchor High wrestling team in his hometown of Candler, North Carolina. He'd end up pursuing and completing a degree in political science at WCU, where he would put out his first music release under the name Reverence in 2004. This self-recorded, self-published album acted as a great showcase of Seth's lyrical abilities and songwriting, and exhibited a range of vocal styles across a few standout tracks, such as Intoxicating and Back On Me. Seth would also play live for a few months with the local band Ironside on rhythm guitar in 2004. Around this time, Southern Cross was forming. Pride Before the Fall bassist Adam Ranke and guitarist Jenna DeGrove had been playing together for a while and were also involved romantically. Seth had an ad out on MySpace for musicians as he wanted to form Southern Cross. Ranke and DeGrove joined up and they recruited Jenna's brother Max to play drums with them under the pseudonym Warfield and began working on material for their debut EP, The South is Rising. Southern Cross would play several shows in the lead-up to their EP release at such venues as the Waynesville Armory and Fred's Speakeasy in Asheville. They'd play a mix of original songs as well as covers of tracks such as Black Sabbath's Snowblind and Pantera's War Nerve, with the latter band becoming a double-edged comparison that would stick with the band for its entire run. They'd play with some great local NC bands during this period, such as Descent and Thousand Year Rain. I actually discovered the band due to this comparison, seeking out bands that sounded like Pantera on various forums and message boards, but that wouldn't be until the release of their debut LP a few years later. But had I stumbled across the band at the release of their debut EP, I'd have been just as, if not even more, blown away. Two thousand and six's The South Is Rising was incredible. It had crunchy and evil guitar riffs, meaty, blisteringly fast bass, and trudging drums that pounded the listener's ear into pure elated mush. Seth snarled and growled his way through the six tracks on the record, with the incredibly talented Mike Dares of the band Hogjaw accompanying him on the opener, a fascination with the morbidly hillbilly. The lyrics to this track would end up resurfacing later in the band's career in the song Huck Finn but they sound so much more evil on this beautifully rough recording. Usually with the debut EP, it's easy to pick out a few standout tracks, but from beginning to end, the South is Rising is unstoppable. A few songs here would make their way through to their debut LP as well. Scry, Purge, and the namesake, The South is Rising, would be carried into the band's first label release, each receiving a different production spin that made it somewhat more palatable to more casual listeners. The EP was rounded out with are You Horrified, an insanely punchy tune which sounded much closer to the likes of Lamb of God than Pantera, though this track would be left on the cutting floor when it came to later releases, instead having parts of it harvested in 2010 for the tracks Doom Swagger and Carpetbagger, both of which became staples of their late career live set. 
The remaining track on the EP was 10 Minutes of Blood. Surprisingly not a 10 minute long epic, but instead a plodding powerhouse of a track with a hefty number of excellent riffs and some of the strongest vocals Seth would ever lay down. At this stage in the band's career, writing duties were shared between the band pretty evenly, with Jenna notably being the force behind the atmosphere in the band's iconic track Purge. Seth's lyrics were already intense and mature beyond his years, and the band were obviously enjoying themselves. It would be interesting to see how different their trajectory would have been had this lineup continued. But alas, it wasn't to last, and by the end of 2006, the DeGrove siblings had departed from the band, leaving Ranky and Aldrichs to find replacements. Early in 2007, Southern Cross would recruit Zach Phillips on guitar, who was close with Seth, also playing with him in his side project, Thicket. The band would soon learn of another band in Canada going by Southern Cross, and thus briefly renamed the group to Southern Crown, before deciding to pay homage to the Dio era of Black Sabbath by becoming the sign of the Southern Cross. The band would continue to play shows sporadically, with Greg Martin filling in on drums for their live performances. During this time, they were also writing new material for their next demo, Written in Stone. They'd record this in Kentucky with Benji Duval, rushing to get it finished before Ranky was deployed with the US Marines. This demo dropped before the year was out, and caught the attention of Season of Mist rep Sean Pellet Pelletier, who'd give Seth a call in November to offer him a three-album contract. Written in Stone fell pretty rapidly into obscurity and was overshadowed by the record deal and buzz but it's a great demo with a number of interesting tracks that would get left behind. Yeah. 7.5 is very ranky, featuring a driving hardcore punk bassline and excerpts from the movie Drugstore Cowboy serving as its intro. It's a real shame that this never made it onto a more widely distributed release, as it really holds up Ranky's inspirations in a badass way. The two instrumental tracks on the album are also great listens. It must have been, and of Mountains and Moonshine, lull the listener into relaxing, set before tracks with sudden, punchy, nosebleed-inducing riffage. Written in Stones of Mountains and Moonshine is not the same track as the opener of their debut LP, and is worth a listen in its own right. The remaining exclusive track on Written in Stone is perhaps the best of the bunch. All I found in Devil Speak is hauntingly crushing and lyrically fascinating detailing not a struggle between wrong and right, but a blurring of the lines between. All I found is excellent, and I was in awe the first time I heard it. This track does not deserve to be forgotten. It deserves a spot in every fan's playlist. Written in Stone also features a bunch of tracks that would later appear on the Of Mountains and Moonshine album. Dead Skies, Appointed Reaper, Hog Calling, and Unwelcome in That House all appear for the first time here, with Hog Calling becoming a fan favourite almost immediately and becoming a landmark of Ranky's writing input into the band. Drums were inputted digitally for this album, as the band was still short a drummer. But after its release, they'd find someone to fill the spot, that being Brett Wilson, who'd been working in Thicket with Seth and Zach. Following the release of Written in Stone, the band set to work on recording their first label release, of Mountains and Moonshine. Buzz began surrounding the group, and many people, myself included, started discovering them as the album came to fruition. Zach Phillips left the band before recording could begin, and Seth took over his guitar duties for the album, leaving the group as Seth, Ranky, and Brett. What the newfound trio created here was legendary. It propelled them into the southern metal zeitgeist, joining bands such as Maylene and the Sons of Disaster, Tombstone Highway, Stone Dozer, and Down at the top of the pack. They were getting magazine features and online interviews, reviews from several bigger names in the critical space, and it's hard to imagine this all not going to the head of Seth, whose name was the only name on the label contract. Many listeners compared this album to Pantera, calling Seth Anselmo's bastard son, and lots of people slated them for a lack of originality. I don't agree here. I think that the vocal comparison is pretty fair, though in 2009, Anselmo could not pull off the kind of power that Seth was imbuing Southern Cross with. The song structures were amazing, and honestly, there's not a single track on this album worth skipping. It is all killer, no filler. Evan Bradford did a great job here with the production, though the bass is unfortunately a lot lower in the mix than on the band's previous works. 
which kind of sucks, as Ranky is seriously one of the best bass players in the southern and groove metal scenes. Many songs on here came from the previous releases, or were assembled from parts of those old tracks, but there's also plenty of new content here, such as Weeping Willow and Eating the Sun, both of which were much slower and more atmospheric, showing a great understanding of dynamics from the group. Stalking Horse and A Stitch in Time jumped into my favourites very quickly, with the former becoming one of the first Southern Cross songs I ever tried to learn how to play on guitar. The previously mentioned Huck Finn was also insane, and the recreations of Purge and Scry were fantastic introductions to the band for new listeners who hadn't been around for their early releases. Brett would leave the band shortly after recording, as he didn't feel the band were touring enough to make it worth his full-time commitment. Thomas White would replace him on drums, now known for his work in Your Chance to Die and the incredible Witch Pit. Ryan Sturm, known as Big Perm, would join the band as well, taking over guitar duties from Seth, and he seriously blew people away with his amazing bluesy shredding. He saved the band until the very end. Ranky would take some time away from the band for personal reasons in the next year, with Thomas's brother Devin filling in the recording process of Demolition, which acted as a precursor demo to their final release, the I Carry the Fire EP. This demo saw very limited distribution, mainly just to friends of the band at shows, such as to Lee Harra of the band Harra, and some members of Line Work, including Trevor Keeney, both fantastic bands if you've never heard of them. This EP featured an early version of I Carry the Fire titled I'll Take the Torch, as well as two pretty rare tracks, Sojourner and Carpetbagger, which were assumedly being held back for the second album. These tracks are fantastic lessons, and really show the less Pantera-like style the band was heading towards following the comparisons heaved upon them in reviews for their label debut. It was fresh to hear and exciting. They were starting to really carve out their sound here, and it gives us a great taste of what we could have expected from that album. I Carry the Fire dropped the two extra songs, but still made a hell of a splash, released for free online to generate buzz for the second album. Doom Swagger is a powerhouse of a track, and If You Find Yourself Looking Back was another soulful ballad, really driving home those dynamics once again. There's not too much to say on this release, as it is pretty much a castrated version of Demolition, but it was still killer. The White Brothers would leave after this, with Ranky coming back into the picture, and Jason Stallings taking up the mantle as the band's final drummer. Album number two would start recording pretty soon after this lineup change, and they went with Evan Bradford at the boards again, as showcased in the Brewing the New studio documentary Seth posted to the official Southern Cross channel in early 2012. Unfortunately, we're still to see this album, as it never released. Seth would get into some legal trouble around this time, and move to Michigan shortly after, leaving his friends and music career behind him, but not before the band members signed off their rights to the music so that he could be the sole owner. And now that's all we know. So many people would love to hear more from this band and unfortunately, likely never will. In retrospect, maybe Seth was referencing the love that the fans have for the band when he said, it's massive, you can't fucking kill it. We can still wish and hope and try and contact him as many of us have been doing in the decade plus since the band split. Perhaps one day he will see that the desire we have for him to come back is genuine. Thank you for watching. I urge you to get in touch if you have any information, or any old recordings, videos or photos of the band, I'd love to get it archived here. I'm also looking to do short interview videos with people who knew the band, so if you're interested, drop a comment below and we can get chatting. It's been amazing to meet everyone who has helped me track this stuff down so far, I appreciate you all.